During this program, we will be presenting a tremendous amount of technical information. This can be more easily understood by making use of the pause, scan, and rewind functions of your VCR. It will enable you to learn at your own pace by watching specific segments over. This tape is also coded for Level 1 Interactive Access. You will note each segment is preceded by a color or number which can be seen during fast scan. Like tabs in a notebook, it will allow you to directly go to those segments that are of the most interest to you. Refer to your workbook for the coded segment menus. We hope you enjoy this tape and find it useful. Hi, my name is Mark Manassi. I'm a teacher and consultant. My firm, Moulton, Manassi & Company, teaches classes and consults on technical topics. My business is making complex topics easy to understand. I'll guide you through an introduction to installing, maintaining, and troubleshooting your IBM PCs or compatibles. Here's an overview of what I plan to do. After this introduction, we'll look at the PC family. The XT, the AT, the PS2 series, and others. When I say PC, I'm referring to the entire line of computers compatible with or improving upon the original IBM PC. So when I say PC, I can be referring to an actual PC, an XT, an AT, or clone. In many cases, the things that I say even refer to a member of the new PS2 family, which we'll also be discussing. I'll offer a very brief historical perspective to show where the PC fits against the backdrop of previous model microcomputers. Then I'll tell you what the different models in the PC family are and how to identify them and their compatibles and clones. Next, I claim that you can do most PC repairs with about $50 worth of tools and some spare parts. About $150 will buy three software packages that will greatly assist you in diagnosing and repairing hard disk problems. One of the major parts of troubleshooting is just pinpointing the faulty component. To do this, you've got to know what components are in the PC. I'll outline the major components of the PC and display them briefly. This will lead to a more detailed look into the PC. If you've never taken anything apart before, or even if you've taken things apart and not gotten them back together, this will show you how to break down the PC easily. With just a few simple rules, anyone can do it. Once we're comfortable with the innards of the PC, I'll talk about some general troubleshooting approaches. How do you proceed if you turn on the PC and nothing happens? How do you find the bad component? Having found it, do you repair it or replace it? I'll discuss all of these. Then, we'll focus on some of the chips that drive the PC. Most you'll never touch, but a few, like memory, you must be comfortable with. I'll highlight troubleshooting memory problems and safe insertion and removal of chips. Fixing a problem component is one thing. But a related trouble is installing a new component so that it doesn't become a problem component. The PC is very expandable, and literally thousands of companies offer add-in circuit boards called expansion boards that extend the PC's capabilities in some direction. Setting up these expansion boards to work in your system is called configuration, and I'll demonstrate that.
The first member of the PC family was called the IBM PC, or personal computer. It is separated from the rest of the family by the following features. First, it is based on the Intel 8088 microprocessor chip. This is significant in that a, the particular chip that a computer is based on determines in large part how much it can do and how quickly it can do it. Second, it has room for five expansion boards. Third, it has a fairly weak power supply with maximum output of 63 watts. This means that the PC itself can't use much more power than a 60 watt light bulb. Fourth, IBM never offered a hard disk for the PC, although you can add one yourself, if you like, from third-party vendors. Finally, like all computers, the PC can perform tasks at a certain fixed speed. Technically, people refer to this as 4.77 megahertz, but most people just use the PC speed as a starting point and measure other computers against that. Two years after the IBM PC's introduction, IBM announced a new model, the XT. XT stands, according to some, for extra technology. People get confused about this, so let me stress, there's very little difference between a PC and an XT. They are almost identical machines. The differences and similarities between the PC and XT are, first, like the PC, it is based on the 8088. Second, it can take the same expansion boards as the PC, but it has room for eight of them, rather than the PC's five. Third, the XT has a 130 watt power supply much better, as we'll see later. Fourth, IBM originally offered the XT only with the hard disk. Later, you could buy it with or without a hard disk. Finally, the XT operates at the same speed as the PC. IBM has released several variations on the PC and XT mold. The PC Portable, the PC Junior, the PC Convertible, the 3270 PC, the XT370, the Industrial XT. All of these are either equivalent to a PC XT, in the case of the portable, the convertible, the junior, and the industrial, or are merely an XT with added circuit boards, as in the case of the XT370 and the 3270 PC. The PC and XT were discontinued by IBM in April 1987. The next member, the AT, was released in 1984, three years after the original PC announcement. AT stands for Advanced Technology. Under the usual PC operating system, PC-DOS or MS-DOS, it's merely just a very fast PC. But Microsoft is promoting a new operating system named OS2, Operating System 2, which will extend the capabilities of the ATs. The effect of OS2 will probably not be felt by PC users prior to late 1988. Many inexpensive AT clones can be found in the marketplace. The AT is a departure from the previous XT and PC models in that it has, first, a newer, more powerful chip, the Intel 80286, known as the 286. Second, eight expansion slots, but six of these are an expanded version of PC XT slots. These allow expansion boards to be designed that can communicate at higher speeds with the computer. Third, a 200 watt power supply, plenty for any application. Fourth, three to seven times the speed of a PC or XT, depending on what programs you are running and what model AT you are using. A variation on the AT appeared in 1986, offered by Compaq Computer. Called the Compaq Desk Pro 386, it employs a newer chip than the 286, called the 80386 or the 386. Hardware-wise, it behaves much like an AT, although much faster. It can run at 8 to 17 times faster than an XT or PC, depending again on what programs you are running. Finally, IBM announced their newest generation of desktop computers on April 2nd, 1987. The PS2s, the Personal System 2. The PS2 line is in many ways a radical departure from the previous models. Some of the major features are, one model, the PS2 Model 80, uses the newer 80386 chip. The PS2 models use a set of completely new expansion slots. Expansion boards for the PC, XT, or AT will not work in PS2 machines. PS2 models offer new graphics capabilities. More informative, colorful, attractive displays will be possible as software becomes available for these computers. 
Similarly, these computers require newer, more expensive monitors. Many functions that do not come with the old machines, like printer ports, serial ports, graphics and mouse ports, come standard with the new machines. Finally, the new computers run faster than the ATs and, of course, the XTs and PCs. The PC family started over six years ago with the now venerable PC. The PC is gone from IBM's product list, but dozens of clone and compatible makers manufacture good, cheap replacements. The latest members of the PC family, the PS2 computers, are not the last step. They have some serious flaws that need to be addressed, and no doubt IBM or some other vendor will address them. But we'll continue to see major changes in the PC market for the foreseeable future, and that'll keep it interesting. Let's look at the tools you'll need. I've claimed that you can do most PC repairs with about $50 worth of tools and $150 worth of software. So let's look at these tools. Here's the basic set. It's a lot cheaper than $50. A straight slot screwdriver or a Phillips head screwdriver can do most jobs in any PC or a clone. Pen and paper are essential because you must keep track of what you're doing when you disassemble anything. Now, I don't do that sometimes, like when I'm sure I can remember how everything goes back together. Then by the time I get everything apart, I usually realize that there's been a memory failure. That's memory here, rather than here. Keep a notebook of everything you learn, or you'll reinvent the wheel time and time again. Now the cup is here, so that you have a place to keep screws, nuts and such, as you disassemble. Be careful not to tip it over. You know, I wish I could always remember that advice, too. Offset screwdrivers can get you into tight places, like, for example, the screws on the side of the PC's disk drives. They're nice to have. Jeweler's screwdrivers are useful for small screws, like the kind that secure connectors into the back of PCs. They can also help extract chips from sockets, although chip pullers do the job a bit better. Those are the necessities Here's some other nice items to add to your toolbox. Hex drivers, whether with a ratchet handle or not, are preferred by some people as a superior way to install and remove screws on the PC. A set of hex drivers with a ratchet is nice in case the person before you secured the screws to the PC with a power screwdriver. It keeps your blood pressure lower. Extraction tools like these tweezers and this special extraction tool are great for when you accidentally drop a small part, like a screw, into some hard-to-reach place like the PC box. I like this extraction tool but before I had it, chopsticks worked very nicely. They're non-conductive and non-magnetic and cheap. This is the culprit that raises the price above $30 for your toolkit. A basic combination voltage, resistance, and current meter will cost about $25. It is useful for checking test points and continuity. Hard disks often can't be repaired. To work on them, you need a facility that would make most chemistry labs look like they're run by slobs. If you saw the movie The Andromeda Strain, you have some notion of what a hard disk repair clean facility looks like. The best you can do to protect yourself is to keep the disk in top shape and to recover whatever data can be recovered in the event of a major hard disk failure. These programs help you do that. They are the Norton Utilities, which are not, is, here, is not here, the MACE Utilities, and the MACE Advanced Hard Disk Utilities, the H-Test, H-Format, Collod Utilities. You can find addresses for them in your book. Discounted, the three will cost about $150. They're well worth the money. They're not copy protected, so they don't create more problems than they solve, and they're fairly easy to learn to use. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you how to disassemble and reassemble a PC. In the process, I'll explain what everything in the PC does. 
Before I do that, though, I'd like to prepare you for that by briefly describing the parts of the PC so you know what to expect to see. Every PC is composed of just a few major parts. The principal parts of the PC are the chassis, the system board, the display board and the display, the floppy disk controller and floppy disk drives, perhaps a hard disk controller and hard disk drive, a multi-function board, a keyboard, and the power supply. The chassis is just the box that holds the parts of the PC. It has pre-tapped points where the circuit boards and power supply fit. The system board is the main circuit board. It contains the microprocessor itself, connections for the power supply, memory and expansion slots. It lies flat in the bottom of the chassis. The display board and display allow you to see the computer's output. The display is an outside device controlled by the computer. All outside devices like the disks or the display, for example, must have a separate controller. Several types of display controllers exist in the PC world for different kinds of displays. The display controller plugs into the system board. The display sits atop the PC chassis. The floppy disk controller and floppy drives allow storage of data on floppy disks. The controller allows the floppy drive to communicate with the computer. The controller talks to the drive via a ribbon cable. The floppy controller plugs onto the system board and the drives are mounted in the chassis. The hard disk and hard disk controller do the same kind of thing as the floppy drive and controller, but the hard disk can hold more data and use it more quickly. Notice that the hard disk controller communicates with the hard disk drive via two cables, not one. The controller plugs onto the system board and the drive is mounted in the chassis. A field of products called multifunction cards have sprung up to fill in some gaps in IBM's product offerings. Cards now exist that can perform four functions. First, they provide enough space for memory expansion. The original PCs only allowed room for 64K of memory. Expansion boards filled in the extra memory capacity. Second, they provide a parallel port, a kind of interface used to communicate with a microcomputer printer. Third, they provide an RS-232 port, also known as a serial port, a kind of interface used to communicate with modems or, less commonly, printers. Finally, they provide a battery-backed clock calendar so that the system knows what time and day it is each time it powers up. Multifunction boards plug onto the system board. The keyboard allows us to talk to the computer. IBM seems to come out with a new keyboard every year or so, each no better than the last. If someone would build a keyboard that looks and feels like an IBM Selectric keyboard for the PC, they'd be rich. The keyboard attaches to the computer via a connector on the back of the system board. Finally, the power supply converts line current to direct current used by the PC. In general, you won't fix the power supply, you'll just replace it. Power supplies are rated in watts. The higher, the greater the capacity. A larger capacity power supply means your PC runs cooler and lives longer, so don't just purchase the minimum. Those are the parts of the PC. Let's take a PC apart now to see some greater detail. Let's get set to take the PC apart. First of all, prepare your work area. Make sure you have enough space to put the monitor on the table beside the PC. Set out your pad or your notebook and pen and a clean empty cup or ashtray. Now the next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to move things away, like uh, remove the monitor from atop the chassis. Move it and the keyboard to the side. You won't always necessarily disconnect them. Sometimes you'll want to run the machine with the top off in order to run some tests to help pinpoint a problem. I'm going to move them just for this example. Next, remove the cover of the PC. 
You do this by removing the screws from the back of the PC at the following points, here, 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 and here. You know, when I disassemble something for the first time, I generally have some trepidation about removing screws. You just never know which screws keep the top on and which ones will make something go clunk inside the chassis when you remove them. Fortunately, on the back of the PC, there's only two kinds of screws. The ones I'm taking out now, which secure the back of the PC, and four others here, 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 and here, that hold in the power supply. We'll take those out later. Take the cover off. And put it aside. Let's take a first look at the inside of the PC. Now again, when I say PC, I'm speaking generically of the PC family. Actually, this is an XT. And we'll see the subtle differences between a PC and an XT in a while. We're inside the PC now. Here, come take a look at it. Notice the power supply. The power supply has got the wires coming out of it here, which supply power to the floppy drive and to the system board and to the hard disk. Now you can't see the system board yet as it is covered by the drives and by expansion boards. This is the floppy drive. This is the hard disk drive. Here are the expansion boards. Notice that this one is connected to the floppy disk with this cable. That's how I know it's the floppy disk controller. Notice that this one is connected with these two cables to the hard disk. That's how I know it's the hard disk controller. Well, now sometimes you'll see a single board doing the job of both floppy and hard disk controller. This is standard on the AT, and you'll see it on some PC or XT compatibles. As the technology advances, manufacturers just get better at squeezing more and more onto a single board. This next board, it's a multifunction board, it's got this odd connector on the back called a DB25 connector. It's called that because it kind of looks like a capital D if you look at it sideways, and there are 25 tiny pins. You'll see two kinds of them on a PC. One with 25 pins, that's the male connector, and one with 25 little holes, that's the female connector. The male plug is used for the serial or RS-232 port used to connect modems or sometimes printers. On an AT and some compatibles, a 25-pin connector is not used. A 9-pin connector is used. This is called, as you would guess, a DB9 connector. The female plug, which by the way we see on this board, is used for a Centronics parallel printer port. This board is the display controller board. I know this because it was connected to the display. Now let's start removing boards. I'll remove the display board first. First, I remove the video connector from the back of it. Now that's already been done because I've already removed the monitor from the machine. Then I remove the screw holding in the mounting bracket on the back of the board. Let me take it out now. It's generally a 3 16 inch hex head screw. Then I grasp the board in the front and the back and rock the board up and out. Put it aside. If you have anti-static foam, that's nice to put it on. In my experience, it doesn't matter much. By the way, it doesn't matter which of the expansion slots you put the board back in. The expansion slots, you can see here, are these connectors that the expansion boards sit in. It doesn't matter which expansion board you put the board back in. The exception to this is the XT. The slot nearest to the power supply 
that's down here is not a complete slot. It should not be used. XT clones and compatibles, ATs and PCs, don't have this problem. The first board we removed was the display board. That's this board. I'd like to take a look at it, but this is actually not an IBM display board. This is a display board that's compatible with an IBM display board made by Hercules. But I'd like to talk about an IBM display board. I have one right over here. This is the IBM Color Graphics Adapter, one of several display controller boards available for the PC. There are not only several display controller types available for the PC, there are also several display types available for the PC. These are summarized in your company book. There are monochrome monitors of two types. Monochrome composite, which is like a black and white TV without a tuner, and monochrome TTL, which takes a more precise digital signal to deliver a more precise clear screen. The monochrome TTL monitor uses a DB9 connector, which connects to the DB9 connector on the monochrome display adapter. The monochrome composite monitor takes a composite signal, such as you find on the color graphics adapter. Don't try to mix them. It won't work, and you could damage something. There are several color monitors. Color composite, which is like a color TV without a tuner, and RGB and EGA monitors, which use a digital signal like the monochrome TTL monitor. These are all supported by the color graphics adapter, and the RGB and EGA are supported by the EGA, which is the enhanced graphics adapter board. Unfortunately, the RGB and EGA monitors use the same DB9 connector like the monochrome TTL monitor. Despite the fact that both the monochrome TTL and RGB use the same connector, the signals are not compatible. If you plug a mono TTL into the 9-pin connector on the color graphics adapter, you can really get smoke. Here's the high points of this board. The large chip is the Motorola 6845, the video controller chip. The other large chip is a ROM, a read-only memory. This ROM doesn't do much. It just stores the patterns that the controller uses to display letters. Without these, the display controller doesn't even know how to make a letter A on the screen. While I'm on the subject of ROMs, let me mention that more complex expansion boards like EGA display boards, hard disk controller cards, local area network boards, and others may have a ROM chip on them. They're easy to spot. They're large chips. They usually have labels on them, and they're usually socketed like this one. ROMs contain software. Software, as you know, goes through changes, and so the contents of ROMs get revised sometimes. Some hardware problems occur only because you have an old vintage ROM on one of your boards. The labels identify the version of the software in the ROM. It's a good idea to write down whatever's on the labels in your notebook. Then when you call for technical assistance, you have this information at your fingertips. The first time I installed a hard disk, I had a controller with old, buggy software in it. When I called the company for assistance, the first thing they asked was, what version ROMs do you have? I didn't know, so I had to end the conversation, rip the computer apart, and call them back. Since then, I've learned. Here is a monochrome display adapter, a mono board. Notice it has a built-in parallel printer port. Here is an EGA board. That's Enhanced Graphics Adapter. The DB9 connector is for a monitor. The EGA can be switched to attach to either the monochrome TTL display or the RGB or EGA display. The two RCA connectors are for the feature connector an obscure feature that IBM put on the EGA that, as far as I know, is only exploited by one commercial product. Next, we'll remove the multifunction board. As I said before, the multifunction board does four things.
First is the memory. The PC can use 640K of memory, and memory is organized generally into banks of either 64K or 256K. Each bank consists of nine chips. One 256K bank looks just the same as a 64K bank, but it holds the equivalent memory of four 64K banks. Thus, you'll find up to 10 banks of 64K on the PC. When a memory is easy to spot, generally a bank consists of nine chips, all small and socketed. Some memory will be on the system board, and we'll see that later. Second function is the clock calendar. Not much to say here, except that it's powered by a battery. Batteries run down eventually, so find out where to get replacements now, so you have some on hand when the current ones run out. Third is the parallel printer port. There isn't much you can do to fix this if the port itself becomes damaged, although that's unusual. Last function is the RS-232 serial port. It is controlled almost entirely by a single chip. It is usually large and socketed. It may have the number 8250 on it. It's called a UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. I fixed a few serial ports just by replacing the UART. They're about $7. And as they're socketed, they're easy to replace and worth trying if a port has failed. Now I'll remove the floppy disk controller. First thing I do is I remove the ribbon that connects it to the floppy disk drive. Maybe you can see it better here. Now before you disconnect it, if it's the first time you've ever done it, please make sure to make a note in your notebook how it goes back on. Actually though, in this case it's easy. You may be able to see here that although you may not be able to, there's a key. But even if there weren't, there's a little trick that makes connecting ribbon cables easy. Let me take the drive controller out and I'll tell you about it. Now take a look at this ribbon cable. You see that it's gray? and it's got the one blue line on it. The one wire on the edge that's colored differently. Now you're going to see this in any kind of ribbon cable. This is wire number one, and it should connect to edge pin number one. How do you find edge pin number one? Well, let's look at this edge connector. There's one right here on the floppy disk controller I just removed. See the 2 under the P2? It's in green against green, so it's a little tough to find. And then the 34. The 1 goes next to the 2. That's how I know when I would be reconnecting them that this blue line goes up near the 2. Now just remove the board. The only thing interesting on this board is the large chip, the NEC disk controller chip. Some technical manuals just call it the neck chip. If a floppy controller dies on you, it's probably this chip, but don't bother trying to replace it. Just buy a new one. Replacements can be had for about $30 from clone makers or mail order. Now, I'll remove the hard disk controller board. It's usually easier to remove the mounting bracket screw, then remove the board a bit and disconnect the cables, like this. Notice that there are two cables, a 20-pin cable, a 20-wire cable, the pins are on the connectors, 
and a 34 wire cable. Now there may be room for a second 20 wire cable, or there may actually be a second 20 wire cable, but it's not used. Remember to note how they connect, although they'll probably follow the pin one rule. Notice again, there's connectors for two 20 pin cables and one 34 pin cable. This would accommodate two hard disks. Each disk has its own 20 pin connector, and the 34 pin connector would be daisy chained. It has two connectors on one end. It generally doesn't matter which 20 pin connector you use in connecting the first hard disk. Next, note the ROM chip on this board. Remember I said it's socketed and it's got a label. We would note this in the notebook. Here we see, for example, 10439RE, whatever that means. We would write it down. So if there's a problem, we can refer to that. Note the dip switch. The dip switch allows us to set hard disk types. You see, controllers are usually made to support a wide variety of disk types. You tell the controller what type to expect by setting the jumpers or dip switches. You'll find the exact setting in the manual that came with the controller. Your controller didn't come with a manual? Contact the manufacturer and get one. You'll find manuals on all your boards will come in handy at some point. Here in the AT, a combination floppy hard disk controller is all on one board. Notice the extended edge connector. These connectors are called 16-bit connectors. The ones you've seen so far on the PC are called 8-bit connectors. Notice the sockets in the AT for the 16-bit connections. The AT has two expansion sockets for 8-bit boards and six expansion sockets for 16-bit boards. Next, we'll remove the floppy drives. Drives are removed in four steps. First, remove the retaining screws. Second, pull the drive out just a bit and remove the power connection. Then remove the data connection. And then just pull the drive right out. Well, now first, floppy drives are held in place on a PC by a pair of screws on the side of the drive. Remember I told you an offset screwdriver would be useful. On an AT, they roll in and out of the chassis like drawers from a desk. You just remove the retaining tabs from the front of the AT, then the drive rolls out. Next, remove the power connection. Let's see if we can arrange so you can see this. That's this little connector here. Now you'll see later that both the hard disk and the floppy, or floppies, have similar looking connections. They're in fact identical, and it doesn't matter which is connected to which. Here, I've just taken it out. An AT may include an extra grounding wire. Just pull it off. Then, remove the data connection. That's our ribbon cable over here. Take a look at the top of the drive. Let's see if we can't see. Once again, the two and the 34. That's a little tough to see. The floppy cable, once removed, looks like this. This side goes on the controller. This connector goes on A and this one on B. But how do I know which is A and which is B? Hope you made a note in your notebook before taking it apart. Notice the end of the cable has a twist in it. 
This is the end that goes to the A drive. The twist tells the controller which drive is A. By the way, keep an extra cable around just to test other cables with. Now let's look at the drive. First, notice this thing here that says T-Res on it that looks like a socketed chip. It isn't. It's actually a resistor called a terminating resistor or terminator. Most drives are shipped with a terminator. The A drive must have a terminator. Remove it from the B drive. Now maintaining drives is simple. Don't put any diskettes in the drives that are obviously dirty or wet. Avoid really cheap diskettes. The oxide on them flakes off and can damage the drive heads. If a problem arises, use a head cleaner kit to clean the disk heads. If the problem persists, should you try to adjust the alignment on the drive? I would say not. It requires expensive tools and is time consuming. If you should buy a head cleaner kit, the head cleaner kit will say to you, clean the heads every week. It's not necessarily a good idea. Some head cleaner kits are abrasive and can actually wear down the drive head. Again, if a problem occurs with the drive, I just replace it. Drives are cheap, usually under $90. Just keep a few on hand and replace the bad ones. And when you have enough bad drives lying around, send them out in bulk to a bulk disk repair shop. They'll align the drives in bulk for about $30 a piece. Oh, and here's a little protection tip. When you aren't using the drives or are moving the drives, don't close the drive doors. You see, there are two drive heads, one on top, one on the bottom, one to read the top of a floppy and one to read the bottom of a floppy. If you close the door with no floppy in the drive, the two heads bash against each other. You can damage both heads that way. So an easy way to protect your diskettes, your diskette drives, is to leave the doors open. When you have a disk problem, first check the diskette itself. Then clean the heads on the disk drive. Try swapping the drive with another drive. If still no luck, swap the controller and cable. And don't forget that sometimes rebooting, just rebooting, can solve the problem. Half-height drives have better speed control and retain their alignment better. Again, if you are responsible for a large number of dri drives, contact the manufacturer to see if you can purchase a technical or maintenance manual. There is usually useful information in these manuals. This varies from drive manufacturer to drive manufacturer. By the way, here's a last difference between full height and half height drives. See the belt and the motor? This is a belt driven drive. Full heights are belt driven. You may recall about 12 years ago, I guess, that direct drive turntables were all the rage in the stereo business. The reason was better speed control. Half-height drives also are direct drive. They don't have belts, so they hold the speed better. Now the hard disk drive. As with the floppy, it has retaining screws. Power connections and a data connection. The only difference is that there are, recall, two data connections, a 20-wire cable and a 34-wire cable. Remove them and the drive comes out. Pull it out just a little bit. Take the power connection off. Can you see where the power connection goes? Then I take the data connections off. There's my ribbon cable. Two cables, actually.
As the drive can't be serviced, there isn't much that you can do. Occasionally, the drive electronics board located under the drive can be replaced to solve a problem. Note while we're here a possible answer to squeaky hard disk drives. See this bearing? Try a little WD-40 lubricant on this bearing if your hard disk is just too noisy. By the way, some drives will have a single circuit board, no hole for the bearing. Just remove some screws and take the board off, then lubricate the bearing. Another cause of squeaky drives is orientation. The drive may not be adequately supported. It then bends just a little and the squeak occurs. Is the drive secured well? Is the PC flat on the desk? If you're going to mount your PC on its side, on the floor, reformat the drive in that position. When the disk is formatted, it should be formatted in whatever position and temperature it will be used in. I said and temperature. Keep that in mind with portable PCs. If you leave them out overnight and you, they get a little cold, you can't expect them to be able to read and write correctly until they warm up. Well, there's not much left. Let's take the power supply out first. Note the power connectors that were connected to the hard disk and the floppy. The only connections left from the power supply are the two connectors to the system board. Let me show them to you. They're right there. Please be sure to draw a picture of this, as there is not always a simple way to remember how the connectors go in. There's a key on the IBM machines to keep you from reconnecting the power supply backwards, but none on some compatibles. Next, I remove the four screws in the back. Then, this is a slightly tricky part if you've never done this before, push the power supply forward a bit. That frees it from a clip built into the chassis. Then it comes out. Notice the switch on it, the power connections, and the sign that tells you in several languages that if you open this up, it will kill you. There, by the way, are the clips Keep that in mind when you're putting the power supply back in. Look at your power supply. Does it have a label on it indicating that it's only a 63.5 watt power supply? Now this one says 130. XTs have 130 watt power supplies. PCs have 63.5 watt power supplies. It's a good idea to upgrade your PC's power supply to 130 watts. Compatible vendors and mail order houses will sell 130 or 150 watt power supplies for the PC for under $100. Now the only thing left are the system board and the speaker. Disconnect the speaker. It can be physically removed from the chassis, but there's no point in it. Now the only thing securing the system board is two screws and some spacers. There's the screw. There's the other screw, and there are spacers. Take these out, and the system board comes out.
hope I made that look easy. Let's take a tour of the high points of the system board. First of all, here's the Intel 8088. That's the heart of the PC. It's the central processing unit, the CPU. Next to it is an 8087, a numeric coprocessor. The 8087 is an option costing about $120. If you do numeric processing, such as if you use Lotus 123, you should invest in one of these. Putting an 8087 in your system will increase Lotus performance by a minimum of three to four times. Near the 8088 is the 8284, a chip that basically supports the speed control and timing mechanism. The reason I pointed out to you is that if you intend to accelerate your PC through any of the many speed-up products available, you probably have to be able to locate this. Now it's socketed on some PCs and you notice it's soldered onto this XT. Note the eight expansion slots. You can put seven expansion boards in here as, remember, you can't use the one closest to the power supply. Now again, a PC proper would only have five and you can use all five of those. The regular rows of socketed chips are memory. Each one is a 64K bank. Here's a bank, bank zero, as you see. Here's another one, bank one, bank two, bank three. A PC proper also has four banks, but the first one would be soldered in. Now that's annoying if you have to change that. Here are the system ROMs. They determine how compatible your compatible is. Notice in this case there are no labels. Often on IBM boards there's no labels on the ROMs. Now let's look at an AT system board. This is the 80286 microprocessor. Here is the location of the socket for the 80287, the numeric coprocessor. This is the AT's version of the 8087. Here are expansion slots. The expansion slots are here. You can see a 16-bit slot and an 8-bit slot. Here is the memory. This is a newer AT motherboard, so you see 256K chips in this location. If you have an older AT motherboard, you will see instead higher chips. There are actually two chips piggybacked, one on top of the other, each 128K chips. These can be a real maintenance problem, so look out for them. This over here, you see, is the crystal. It looks like it's got white pants on. It's a socketed crystal. That's a little unusual. AT speed-up kits require that you locate this in order to accelerate your AT. It's cheap and a good idea. For under $100, you can get appreciably more speed from your AT. Well, that's your system in pieces. To reassemble, just do everything in reverse. Now I'll show you how to disassemble a PS2 Model 50. It has been billed as a simpler computer to maintain. IBM says that it can be disassembled without tools. This is true until you get to actually removing the motherboard from the chassis, and that only requires an ordinary screwdriver. It is a simple machine to disassemble, but knowing a few tricks will make the process a little easier. First, we'll remove the cover. It is secured with two large knurled screws, right here and here. You can turn them by hand. Once you get them loose, pull them out. They don't come out completely. Then the cover slides forward and off. The PS2 manages a smaller footprint by employing this double-decker design. We'll first remove the second floor, and on the second floor there is a fan, a couple of drives, and then we'll be able to see the system board, actually called by IBM the planar board. The battery for the battery-backed memory and the speaker are next. You can see that here. It's all one assembly. Just push this little catch. It's under here and it's a little tough to see. Let me point it out. Right there. 
I'm just going to push that and then pull up the whole assembly. Thumbs lifts up and out. This is the battery that holds the configuration information, much as the battery does on the AT, except as I'll talk about it later, it actually holds more information than that. Now, let's take out the floppy drive. It also has a catch in front, right there. Push it up, and the drive can be removed. This is a three and a half inch, 1.44 megabyte floppy drive. See the edge connector on the back. The floppy drives are connected to an extender board. There's room for two floppies here. The extender board is held in place with a bracket clip. You may not be able to see it very well there. I'm moving it so you can see it. But let me turn the machine around and you'll see it much better. There we are. Right there. Move the clip. And then the extender board comes right out. Put the extender board and the clip aside. Next is the hard disk and controller. The hard disk has two tabs that hold it in. Again, they're a little tough to see. Let's see if you can see the first one here. And the second one is just behind it. And that's there. I'm going to push down on both of these. And then push the drive over. And the drive comes up and out. This is a 20 megabyte drive. And notice that the drive doesn't use that standard two ribbon interface we've seen before. By the way, that two ribbon interface is called an ST506 interface. And it's an industry standard. Now we'll take out the hard disk controller. You can see it here. The two blue tabs allow us to take it out. As always, just rock it out gently. Take a look at it. Notice that it is smaller than the AT and PC boards that we've seen before. Remember that boards for the PS2, called micro-channel boards, are incompatible with PC and AT boards. Now we'll take out the fan. The fan is held in place with these punch-down snaps at these two points. Now they can be released by pulling up on them. This can be done by hand. But for some of them, they can be a bit difficult. That's why there's a little tool attached to the plastic case right here. You remove it, and the punch down snaps come right off. Once the punch down snaps are out, the fan assembly lifts out, and we put it aside. The second floor, which is now empty, is held in place with seven more punch down snaps. You can see one, two, three, four of them here. One right here. One here. And one here. They're obvious. Take them out. And the second floor comes right out. 
Now that the second floor is off, we can see the planar board. Let's take a look at the planar board. Once again, the Model 50, like the AT, is based around the 80286 chip. Here's the 80286. Hopefully, you'll never have to remove it. Here is the 80287 socket next to it for the numeric coprocessor. Here are four micro-channel expansion slots. This one is used by the hard disk controller. And notice this one's a little bit longer. The one that's a little bit longer accommodates an expanded, improved video board. Again, these slots are incompatible with existing PC and AT boards. Next thing I'd like to show you are the memories. Now, the memories are here. You notice they look a little different. They're standing on their side. Well, these are special kinds of memories, and they're called SIMS, Single Inline Memory Module. You'll see more and more of these as time goes on. Let me turn it on its side so you can see it just a, bit, a little bit better. To take these out, you see a little catch right here. A couple of catches. I'm just going to pop those catches aside, and the memory pops forward. Then you can take it right out. Here are the ROMs, the system ROMs. Here is the power supply. It's obviously designed differently than the power supplies that are used on the PC or the AT. Well, that's disassembling the PS2. Let's notice two things. First, the hard disk. Remember that it doesn't use the ST506 interface. That will restrict your source of alternate hard disk supply. Also, the PS2 Model 50's hard disk is very slow, less than half the speed of the AT's drive. Second, on the planar board, everything electronic is on one board, the planar board. If something simple like the printer port goes out, the entire $1,400 planar board must be replaced. This makes maintenance an all-or-nothing matter. As time goes on, that'll all change. But you may consider those two factors when deciding whether or not to buy PS2s immediately. In the long run, however, one thing is for sure, the PS2s are here to stay. Here's a last note before we end this particular section. You may think, well, he's making it look easy, but that's because he's been doing it for years. That's not entirely true. In the case of this brand new machine, the PS2, this is only the second time I've disassembled a PS2. Now let's take this information we've learned about disassembling PCs, ATs, and PS2s and apply them with some troubleshooting techniques. Now we've seen how to take the machine apart and put it back together again. You know how to identify boards. Now let's apply it to some more specific troubleshooting techniques. Now the reason I went through a disassembly in such detail is because I want you to understand and be able to identify and be comfortable with the replaceable components of the PC. Now, if you truly have a hardware problem, the way you're going to fix it, the way to resolve it, is to identify that failed component and just replace it. Occasionally, you will try to repair the component, but that's rare. Now, there's a table in your book that shows the most, the most replacement parts are $100 or under. So the point is that it wouldn't be cost effective for you to try to fix that component, even if you could. All troubleshooting problems can be decomposed into steps. You really have to be methodical, or you'll thrash helplessly about, forget what you've tried and not tried, and get frustrated. Once you get frustrated, your chances of getting anything fixed, specifically computers, are much less. Now, following is a method that I use. It looks a lot like methods used by other people, but it's not the only method. Find the method that you like, and then stick to it, as long as it's a method. You know, the way I get into trouble is when I do this, this will only take me five minutes kind of repairs, and I don't have a method. 
Here's my approach. First, check for operator error. Second, check that everything's plugged in. Third, keep notes in your notebook. Fourth, check the software. Fifth, ask, what am I doing differently? Sixth, if the computer can run, that is, if it's malfunctioning for some reason, but it does run, use external signs and diagnostic programs to pinpoint the problem component, then replace it. If the computer does not run at all, you have a slightly different approach. Disassemble it and then reassemble it until the problem recurs. Let's look at these in some detail. Check for operator error. It's probably responsible for most of the PC problems. It either occurs because someone is rushed or inexperienced or sometimes just plain sloppy. Now I'm not saying don't trust the users, as some do, but it never hurts to check. Check that everything is plugged in. Boy, can this be embarrassing. I know this sounds stupid, but we've all done it. Not only is everything plugged in, but is everything in tight? Multiple pin connectors can slowly bend under gravity unless the mounting screws are tightened. There's a tendency not to do that, not to take that extra step, but you should. As someone stretches his or her legs under the desk, a loose power cord can be moved enough to disconnect it or to disconnect it and reconnect it. Connectors on the floor also take a lot of abuse. Keep notes. When you're trying to fix something, you're doing it under stress. Someone, maybe you, needs that PC now. You forget what you've tried and what you haven't tried. Keeping notes allows you to walk away from a problem for a while, then come back to it later, perhaps with a better insight. Software can be a common culprit. Before you replace the parallel print, printer port, check it with more than just your word processor. Try doing a screen print. Check any memory resident programs that you may be using. Memory resident software like Sidekick, Metro, ProKey, SuperKey, and the like are great. For example, say you're running DBase. You don't have to exit DBase or WordPerfect to do a simple calculation. Make a note or enter an appointment in an electronic calendar with Sidekick, for example. Just press a particular key combination and Sidekick pops right up. You do your work, then press Escape, and Sidekick goes back to sleep. At least that's the way it's supposed to work. Often it doesn't, however. Sometimes you press the key combination and the PC goes to sleep, taking DBase with it. When odd things occur software-wise, memory resident, ap resident applications are the first suspect. Reboot the computer without the memory residence and try the operation again. If the problem goes away, try to reproduce the software failure and contact the manufacturer of the memory resident software. They may have a fix for the problem, or you may just start the process that eventually leads to a fix. Check that the software is installed correctly. If you have, for example, an Epson printer, and you tell the software that the printer is actually in Oki data, you'll get very unpleasant results when you try to print. Ask what's different. If the printer worked yesterday, what's different about today? I saw a case recently where a printer stopped working, and the only difference, a seemingly irrelevant one, between yesterday and today was the addition of a communications support expansion board. It turned out that the communications board used the same resources as the printer. They fought for these resources, and so neither worked. Software upgrades can bring problems. Perhaps an application running under DOS 2.1 has just enough memory space to run. The extra 20-odd kilobytes required by DOS 3.2 makes it unable to run. One of my clients, in another example, told me of a macro that they wrote for Lotus 123 version 1A that took three minutes to execute. Under Lotus version 2, it took 52 minutes. If the printer is failing, obviously go to the printer adapter first once you've checked that it isn't a software problem. Also try swapping the printer. Most computers and expansion boards come with some kind of basic diagnostic routine run these. If you run the IBM diagnostic program, 
It will report information, but it will report problems as three or four digit error codes. You can only find out what these codes are by buying the $175 advanced diagnostic utilities. You need not do this, however. They're included in a table on your workbook. There's also a mini diagnostic routine called the POST, the Power On Self Test. The PC does this every time you turn it on. You may see one of four diagnostic messages at this time. You may see a 201 error. That means you've got a memory problem. You may see a 301 error. That indicates that you've, generally it means that you haven't plugged in the keyboard. But it may mean that while you were booting up, you had your hand on the keyboard, leaning on the keyboard. A 601 error indicates that either your floppy disk controller or drive A is experiencing some kind of problem. And finally, if you've got a hard disk, 1701 indicates that either the hard disk has failed or the hard disk controller has failed. When you find a bad component, like a printer adapter, what should you do? Well, add-in boards are so cheap these days, I recommend you just discard the old board and put a new one in. Printed circuit board repairs are time-consuming and expensive. Maintenance firms don't repair boards. They just throw them away. You should too. There are, of course, some exceptions. I'll talk about situations where you can and should repair boards in a little while. Keep the equivalent of a PC's worth of parts for every five to 10 PCs you own. Now think about this. If you buy one or two extra PCs for every 10 PCs you buy, and just use them for parts. You've made a one-time 20 to 10% investment in repairs. If you buy an on-site maintenance contract, on the other hand, you're incurring an annual cost of 17 to 20%. Well, now, what if, on the other hand, the computer won't run at all? Well, obviously, you can't run the diagnostics if the computer won't run at all. Here's one approach. Strip the computer down to the bare essentials. Motherboard, power supply only. Set the dip switches on the motherboard for no display and 64K memory. Then turn the computer on. You should hear the whir of the power supply fan, then a single beep. Now, if you don't hear the whir, stop right there. The fan on the power supply gets power before the power supply does. That means if you don't hear that whir, either you're not getting power or the fan is bad. And if the fan's bad, don't run the PC. You'll overheat it and damage everything. If that works, if you get your whir and your beep, then put the display board in, reset the dip switches so the computer expects a display, and boot up. You'll see something like this. Continue this process, adding one item at a time until the PC fails. The last item more than likely caused the failure. By that I mean keep adding devices and booting up, adding devices and booting up, until finally it refuses to boot. The last item is more than likely what caused the problem. Now you may not have IBMs. You may have some clone or compatible. This technique still works. Now it is essential that you try this out on a working computer, and perhaps today, if not very soon. That way, when you eventually have to do it with a diseased machine, you'll know what to expect. That's the overall approach to troubleshooting. Let's continue now with a look at the specific problems you face working with the chips on the circuit boards. As I've said, you won't generally try to repair boards, so you needn't mess with individual chips, usually. But there are a few exceptions, a few cases where being able to handle chips will be useful. First, you may have to, or want to, replace a microprocessor. You may have to do this if bugs have been found in your microprocessor. An example of this is Intel's 80386 chip. The first bunch have a multiplication problem under some circumstances. People who have early 386s, like early buyers of the Compact Desk Pro 386, 
will have to replace their 386 processors eventually. You may want to improve the performance of your PC or XT by removing its 8088 and replacing it with a V20. Now you may recall, come take a look here, the 8088 is the main processor on the XT system board. The V20, the V20 is a chip designed by NEC that sells for about $20. It's completely software compatible with the 8088 and it offers modest performance improvements from about 5% in most areas to as much as 40% in simple integer arithmetic. I won't install this now, but you'll see how to remove chips a little later. A second set of chips you might work with would be numeric coprocessors, such as you may recall the 8087. Again, come take a look here and you'll see on the motherboard a space for an 8087 numeric coprocessor. Here is the 8087 numeric coprocessor itself. You might want to get one and install it. No, now most PCs are sold without them, although they could certainly use them. Given the number of Lotus 123 users in the PC world, at least. Now, if you want one, you're certainly best off buying and installing it yourself. An 8087 chip that's $120 discounted can be twice that if installed. This essentially means that some dealers charge 120 bucks for the 20 minute operation of opening the PC and inserting an 8087. That's not a bad hourly rate. A third reason to work with chips is ROM upgrades. Here's an example of a ROM upgrade. Take our color graphics adapter. You may recall that I mentioned that on the color graphics adapter there is a ROM chip. That's this chip here. The chip here is the character generator ROM. It tells the color graphics adapter how to form letters. Now, if I want to run a particular computer language called APL, well, APL uses a non-standard character set. In order to show that non-standard character set, I'm going to remove that ROM and replace it with this one. You can see right on it, it says APL characters. This will mean that my PC will no longer generate normal PC characters, but APL characters. Not for everybody, but if you're running APL, it's a necessity. Let's see how to do that. First, I'm going to take the old chip out. And probably the easiest way to do this is with a small tweaker screwdriver, as I mentioned. I just get under the chip, and I give it a little just a little pull up and come around to the other side. I hope I'm not blocking your view. It comes up a little bit of time. And out. I'll put it aside. Then I'll install the APL character ROM in its place. I'll have more to say about installation in just a few minutes. Local area network and micro to mainframe expansion board products often need a ROM upgrade at some point in their lives. The last common set of chips you'll deal with are memory chips. And here on the motherboard you may recall that the memory is here in this area. It's the small socketed chips. You may be inserting memory to increase the memory capacity of the computer, or you may be replacing a faulty chip. Let's look into identifying memory problems. First, there's generally no question when a memory error occurs. The screen clears, and the dread parity check one appears, taking your work with it. Memory is organized into banks of 64K. 
here's one, here's another, here's another, and another. I'll turn it, and you can read that right on the circuit board it says bank zero, bank one, two, three. Nine 64K chips constitute one 64K memory block. This is because each chip contains one bit, and there are, of course, eight bits in a byte. 64K bytes of memory are, then, contained in eight 64K bit chips. Well, you say, that's, that's eight. Where's the ninth, Mark? The ninth is called the parity bit, and it's there because it uses a technique called parity to detect hardware memory errors. If the memory error is detected within the power-on self-test or while running the diagnostics, you will see a message like, for example, 3080 space 201. You'll see it just for a second. Then the screen will clear and parity check one will pop up. At that point, the machine's locked up. Let's see how to decode this. First, ignore the 201. It just tells you that you have a memory error and you didn't get anyone to tell you that. You are concerned now with the first digit and the last two digits. The first digit identifies which 64K bank has the bad chip. The last two digits identify the bad chip within that bank. There are 10 banks of 64K on a 640K computer. You can see the first four here, numbered 0 to 3. Computer people always count from 0 rather than 1. The other six banks are on the multifunction board. Therefore, if we got this 3080 error, we'd know the bad chip is in row 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. This row. The 80 indicates which chip. The chips have ID numbers from left to right. Now, I'll show this to you, but it's also in your book. You count 00, 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 04, 0, 08, 10, 20, 40, 80. 80 zero. Zero is then this chip. That's the procedure for reading parity errors. We find the 64K bank with the first digit. That's this one. Then find the chip with the last two digits, and I'd know that's the bad chip. As long as I'm talking about chip identification, let's take another example. This is a expansion board, it's a multifunction board called the Diamond I.O. board. How do you know one chip from another? They all pretty much look the same. Well, they're marked on the top. Take a look at this board. In particular, look at this chip. This chip is called an 8250, and it provides most of the horsepower for this board's RS-232 serial port. What does the writing on the top mean? First, Take a look at the top line, where you see the plus 8540. 8540 means that it was made in the 40th week of 1985. Second, the bottom line says what it is. INS refers to the maker. NB gives information such as package type. Both aren't very important. What is more important is the chip identifier. 8250. Well, that's one example. Let's go back to the memory chips now. Can you see those? They're a little bit smaller, but take a look at one of them. Memory chips tend to have markings like 4564N-20. These names tell us their capacity and their access speed. Fast computers need fast memory, memory that can respond quickly enough to the increased speed of its CPU. Response time is measured in nanoseconds. These are very small, they're billions of seconds. Slow memory responds in 250 nanoseconds. Fast memory responds in 80 nanoseconds, and there's even faster memory. 
Older computers use 64K memory chips, chips that hold 64K bits. Newer computers are built around 256K or 1 megabit chips. The very oldest PCs actually have some 16K chips on them. Yet, and this is important, they're all the same physical size. If I were to show you one of these chips, you couldn't tell from across the room whether it was 16K or a megabit. How can they be identified? Well, a chip with the marking 4164, 4264, or in this case, 4564, is a 64K memory chip. 41256, or 4256, etc., refers to a 256K memory. 4116 would be a 16K memory, and so on. A dash and a number, like this 4564N-20, refers to speed. Dash 20 has 200 nanosecond response time. That means if you ask it for something, it can respond to your request in 200 nanoseconds or better. Dash 15 has 150 nanosecond response time. Just take the speed and drop a zero. 200 becomes 20, 150 becomes 15. Thus, a chip that says 41256-12 is a 120 nanosecond, 256K chip. 4116-25, found on the oldest PC motherboards, is a 250 nanosecond 16K chip. Well, now let's look at handling chips. How can you safely handle chips? Here's a simple method. Let's say I'm going to install an 8087. I want to install it in an XT motherboard. Well, the first thing you've got to know is that you should install it in a low static environment. This means if it's the middle of winter and you're wearing the acrylic sweater that produces sparks visible in a dark room when you take it off, remove it before you get started. If you can walk across a room's carpet and get a shock touching a doorknob, something's wrong. It sounds silly, but when things get that dry and static prone, you've got a good chance of zapping chips. I either make sure I'm working on an area with a wood floor or, and I'm serious about this, I take off my shoes and my socks. In theory, cotton socks and all leather shoes will do the same thing, but most leather soled shoes have rubber heels negating the benefit of the leather. So that's the first thing. I want to keep myself from building up a lot of static. Second, Ground yourself before touching the chips. Generally, there's a metal table leg around or a metal lamp or something like that. And I would just touch that metal. Third, lay out some aluminum foil, or in this case, I've got conductive foam. Spill the chips out. In this case, I'm not spilling a lot of chips out. I'm just putting one down. Put all five fingers on the foil. Now any minor static differences between the fingers are evened out, so you won't destroy the chip when you pick it up. You can now pick up the chip with impunity. Finally, you'll have to bend the legs of the chip just a bit so it fits into the socket. Do it on the foil like this. Then it'll go in fine. Ah, before I put it in, notice that the chip can go in this way or this way. Now, which way is correct? Notice the notches. Can you see these? All the chips have got notches on them. Every chip on the board is oriented in the same way. So just orient your 8087 Give it a little push, and it's in. Check that all legs have gone into the socket properly. It's very easy to bend a leg. Here's a few final memory chip tips. First, suppose you have a computer that uses 200 nanosecond memory chips. Can you use 150 nanosecond chips? 
Will they make your computer faster? Well, the answer is yes and no. You can use any chips that are faster than required, but you'll get no better performance from them. For example, if your computer requires 200 nanosecond chips and you put in 150s, that's fine. But don't put in 250s. Second, don't mix chip speeds in a single row. If your computer needs 200 nanosecond or faster, it's perfectly fine to have one row of 256 nanosecond chips and a separate row of 200s as long as the computer needs 200 or faster. But don't mix them. Don't take one row and mix 150s and 200s. You'll get spurious errors. Finally, whenever possible, avoid mixing manufacturers in the same row. Now, I flatly cannot explain this, but I have seen cases like the following. I have two rows of chips, one entirely Mitsubishi, another entirely Toshiba, that work fine. Then I mix the rows. Errors occur. Restore the rows, the problem disappears. In this final section, I'd like to talk about another important topic, configuration and installation. Now you already know quite a bit about getting inside your PC and diagnosing problems with existing equipment. But you probably spend as much time installing new equipment as you do fixing existing equipment. New equipment offers a few special problems. These problems come under the heading of configuration. Here's a few examples of configuration problems. You install an internal modem in a PC with a floppy disk controller, color graphics board, and multifunction board. The modem refuses to work. What's worse, a little testing shows that the serial port, which used to work, doesn't work either. What do you do? You install a multifunction board in a computer with a floppy disk controller and a generic monochrome graphics card. The printer won't work. What do you do? You install a Lotus Intel Microsoft expanded memory board in an XT, and you notice the next time you boot up, that the clock calendar has been reset to January 1st, 1980. What do you do? Well, each of these problems are resource conflicts. Here's what caused the problems. In the first case, both the serial port on the multifunction card and the modem sought to be recognized by the computer as COM1, communications port number one. As a result, neither would work. The answer is to convince one of the boards to be the other communications address, COM2. In the second case, both the multifunction board and the monochrome graphics card had a parallel port, both trying to be recognized by the PC as LPT1, parallel printer port number one. The answer, once again, is to either convince one of the ports to be LPT2 or LPT3, because remember the PC recognizes LPT1, 2, and 3, or perhaps to disable it altogether. You might disable it if you had no need for two printer ports. In the third case, the expanded memory board and the clock calendar tried to talk to the 8088 computer chip via the same input-output address called an I.O. port. The answer, as before, is to convince one of these boards to use a different I.O. address. You resolve resource conflicts by changing one of the following things. Input-output addresses, direct memory access channels, and interrupt request levels. Now, these sound a little complicated, and a little frightening sounding, but they're not. You don't even have to know what they are. Just understand that two devices cannot use the same I.O. address, DMA channel, or IRQ level. Now you can't see these, just as you can't see a memory location. They're locked away in chips on the motherboard. First, let's talk about I.O. addresses. How is information actually transferred from a peripheral, like a serial port, to the microprocessor? Just as the 8088 or 8286 microprocessor can read from or write to a memory location, so also are there things like memory locations, 
set aside for input-output devices. These are again like memory addresses, and they're called I.O. addresses. Each device that must communicate with the 8088 has an I.O. port or ports. This port cannot, again, be used by any other device. This means that, for example, if you have a clock calendar talking to your PC via port 258, and the PC talks to an expanded memory board via port 258, then the clock calendar and the expanded memory will interfere with each other, and perhaps neither will work correctly. Let's take a look at some dip switches and jumpers. This is the Diamond I.O. board. Let's say one device must be reconfigured to use a different I.O. address. This is where the jumpers and dip switches on an expansion board come in. These are dip switches, and here are jumpers. Realizing that they cannot know what ports are currently in use in your computer, manufacturers give you a choice of possible ports. Moving the jumpers or dip switches allow the choice. In many cases, the board is pre-configured at the factory to the correct settings, but not always. It is hard for the manufacturer to know what the proper settings should be. PS2 owners, you will be spared dip switches and jumpers. PS2 expansion boards are intended to do all that with software. You will be able to configure a board without touching it, and I'll talk about your systems in a minute. If troubleshooting is your job, then it's probably a good idea to keep in your notebook a roster of PCs and which I.O. ports are used by each. Your workbook has a list of common uses of I.O. ports. For example, you can see from this table that a serial port designated COM1 must use addresses 3F8 to 3FF. By the way, don't worry about the fact that the addresses are not entirely numerical. They may contain the letters A through F. This is called hexadecimal notation, and it's just a different numeric representation. Before I go on to DMA and IRQ, I should mention that there isn't always a happy ending with configuration problems. The example that I cited above of an expanded memory board and a clock calendar is a true story. The bad part came when I wanted to change the clock's I.O. port. The designers hadn't had the foresight to include switches so that the I.O. port could be changed. Unfortunately, the designers of the expanded memory board had the same problem. That meant one board went into the trash. Don't assume that expensive boards will have this option to change I.O. ports. Many IBM boards, for example, don't allow reconfiguration. Transferring data from a device into the computer via the CPU can be very slow. So some devices have the power to write data directly into the computer memory without CPU intervention. This is called DMA, direct memory access. The PC has a single DMA controller chip, the 8237. It allows up to four DMA channels. Memory uses channel zero to refresh itself. Memory refresh refers to the fact, not known by most people, that some kinds of memory, dynamic memory it's called, must be reminded of its contents. When the CPU saves some information to memory, the memory can only remember it for a few microseconds. This means that, means that time must be spent refreshing the memory. PCs actually spend about 7% of their time doing this. Some new PCs use static memory, which does not need to be reminded. They are, accordingly, faster. The floppy disk controller, continuing, usually employs channel 2. The hard disk controller uses channel 1. Channel 3 is unused in general, and DMA channels are, therefore, scarce. The AT has eight DMA channels. Your book has this table of DMA assignments. To get the CPU's attention, interrupt request lines, or IRQ lines, are used. The PC has eight, numbered from 0 to 7. For example, COM1 uses interrupt line 4. 
When a line is activated, the processor drops everything and loads a special program written to handle that particular interrupt. You see the common uses of IRQ here. This table, by the way, is again in your workbook. As interrupt 2 is the unused one, many odd devices like local area network boards make use of it. Before I go on to some configuration examples, let's consider one more installation woe, adequate power. Remember the memory chips? Say you're going to install a new board in a PC. If you have one of those 90-pound weakling PC power supplies, can you afford that extra board power-wise? Well, everyone knows that PC hard disk drives draw a lot of power. But what about those expansion boards? Any worries there? Surely not, many people say. No moving parts, no motors. Actually, memory boards draw a considerable amount of power. A full complement of 640K represented as two banks of 256K chips and two banks of 64K chips use 13.4 watts at peak. That's 21% of a 63.5 watt PC power supply. By comparison, some hard disks' peak power consumption is only 1.2 watts. This gets worse if you have an older PC or XT that only accepts 64K chips. 10 banks of 64K chips, 640K, would draw 30 watts at peak. Now let's look at a few examples. Here's the Diamond I.O. board again. It's got a parallel port, a serial port, and a clock calendar. Suppose we want to put this in an AT that already has an internal modem using COM1. That means we can disable the clock as an AT already has a clock calendar built in. And we must move the serial port to COM2. Again, notice the jumpers and the dip switches. The documentation says that switch number 2 of switch block 1 enables or disables the clock calendar. So I'll set that. We know from earlier tables that COM1 and 2 use not only an I.O. address, but an IRQ level as well. COM2 will need address 2F8 and IRQ level 3. Generally, addresses and levels are set separately. And that's the case here, too. The documentation tells us to configure for 2F8, change this dip switch. And so I do. Then it says to move these jumpers, and you can do that with your fingers, like I've done here. But sometimes it's a little easier to use a pair of pliers. I use some pliers to take this out. and then just move it to this other position. Here's another example. Say you've got a lot of XTs and PCs in your office. As time goes on, the presence of faster computers makes the PCs seem slow. You'd like to boost their speed a bit, so you're going to replace the motherboards and the XTs and PCs with clone motherboards that add the ability to switch to a turbo speed. Now we've got to set some switches on the motherboard as I do on the PC and XT. Here's such a motherboard. Again, this would replace your XT motherboard or your PC motherboard. Now things we've got to tell motherboards in the PC family are, first of all, whether or not there's an 8087 numeric coprocessor, Second, how many floppy disk drives the system has. Third, the kind of display adapter in the computer. And fourth and finally, the amount of memory in the computer. This particular motherboard also allows us to put either 256K or 64K chips on the four planar banks. But you've got to tell the motherboard whether to expect 64K chips or 256K chips. And a jumper that's over here sets that. 
By the way, I've been talking about how you move the jumper from one point to another, move dip switches. How do I know that? There's no way to look at a board unless you have the documentation. If you don't have the documentation, there's no way to guess. No rules like the pin one rule. The dip switch bank is the same as on an IBM XT, as it turns out. There are eight switches. Their functions are described in a box on your workbook. We don't have a coprocessor installed at the moment, so switch two is on. I'll go over to switch two and notice on is up. So I'll move it like so. This machine will have two floppy disk drives. So switch one is off. It's already off. Switch seven is off. That's already off. And switch eight is on. We'll use color graphics, 80 by 25. So switch five is on and switch six is off. Finally, we're putting maximum memory on the motherboard, so switches 3 and 4 are off. Notice that this switch conveniently says on. This indicates which location is on, and obviously the alternative is off. But some switch banks don't say on, off. They say open, closed. Generally, closed means on. But in some cases, there's no label at all. Here you must just play with it. Yes, I, I know this is uncivilized and unfair, but tell the manufacturers. When you figure out which is on and which is off, make a note in your notebook. You don't want to have to do that twice. Now before I leave, a few notes on configuration with the PS2s. For those of you with the PS2 model 50, which is here, or the 60, or the 80, you'll never have to deal, well, maybe, with the preceding pain and suffering of jumpers and dip switches. The personal system line includes the new micro-channel architecture bus, an improvement in some ways over the old PC bus. First, no dip switches. PS2 machines have 16 IRQ lines, that's second, and third, eight DMA channels, plenty for any application. You know that the AT uses battery-backed memory to retain some configuration information. This does not assist in installing new expansion boards on the AT. In the PS2s, however, this memory remembers IRQ, DMA, and I.O. port information for expansion boards. When the machine is powered up, it checks each board against the information in the battery-backed memory. If a new unknown board is detected, the user will be requested to run a setup program. There's been a lot of hype in the popular press about how you'll never have to worry about configuration again with the PS2. It's not really true. You still have to worry about two boards not using the same IRQ lines, but fixing the problem is easier. You just run a setup program rather than pull the board out and set dip switches. The extra DMA and IRQ channels will make the configuration job easier also. Well, you know, there's lots more to talk about when it comes to troubleshooting, but that's all we have time for here. Now you have the information to get started in installing, maintaining, and troubleshooting PCs. There's a lot to learn, and that's what keeps it fun. Start your notebook. Assemble your tools. Break down your computer to the motherboard and rebuild it to get the practice. The most important thing you must have in order to fix anything is confidence. You'll get that confidence only by applying what you've learned today, as soon as possible. Well, thanks for your attention. Goodbye and good luck. Continuing a quality professional education is a need met by Data Tech Institute, a leader in presentation of one, two, and three day seminar workshops. The data tech proven curricula, taught by highly qualified technical experts in their field, responds to rapid changes in technology. Programs are equipment-based offering tips, tricks, and techniques that can make a real difference in your career. Data tech is set apart by live in-class training, featuring hands-on demonstrations, comprehensive course material, 
free software and a track record substantiated by hundreds of Fortune 1000 corporations who have attended the seminars. Data Tech Institute, actively solving problems facing the business professional in the working environment.